Today is Wednesday midweek service. As you sit down, or maybe even driving, or you are gathering with your family, you can listen to the message, uh, which can renew uh, us in the discovery that we are the beloved children of God. And we want to thank God for giving us this opportunity that uh, uh, through technology we are able to listen to the word of God anywhere where we are. Let us pray. God of our Father, break smalls and give of insight. Challenge our attitudes, discomfort and mindset, and soften our hearts that we might see and respond to your purposes. God who called the world into being, who calls us to follow Christ, close our minds to distractions. Open our ears to hear your call. Open our hearts to receive your love and open our eyes to the needs of our community. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I will call Brother Ben to come and read the word of God from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. Yeah, great Wednesday again. Uh, hope you're all going well this week. Uh, Wednesday is a great day because we get to come and hear the word of God and um, good for me because I get to read it to you. So uh, today I'll be reading Matthew 21, 23 to 32. So Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I'll also ask you one question. If you answer me, I'll tell you why, by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, Then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go, to, go and work in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first one they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to, to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. And uh, this is the word of the Lord. And uh, we'll get Johnson back to share the message. Thanks, Johnson. Can't wait. Good morning once again. Uh, uh, this morning I've decided to come up with a theme. When yes means no. And no means yes. When yes means no, and no means yes. What's your opinion? If you have two sons, and you tell one of them to do a job, and his answer is no, then afterwards he does it. And you tell the second one to do the job, same job, and his answer is yes, I will go. And he doesn't do. Which one is doing what you told him and following your will? That's the story Jesus told the crowd. That's the question he posed to the religious leaders of his day. The crowd answered Jesus by saying, the son who said no, and then changed his mind, did the work, was better than the other son. So Jesus said, that's right. And he illustrated that by saying that the tax collectors, the prostitutes of the day would go into the kingdom of God before the Jewish religious leaders to whom he was speaking. So this parable was told for a special reason. 
Jesus was saying that the Jewish leaders were like the son who said yes. That he would obey and then did not do. Jesus is saying that the tax collectors and the hallows are like the son who said no. Changed his mind and finally ended up obeying. So in our text, it goes like this. Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the hallows go into the kingdom of God before you. Think about it. I don't like either son's behavior. Neither son would bring joy to me if I were his father. That's the key to understanding this parable. Jesus is not praising either son. Jesus holds in front of us two sets of imperfect people, of whom one set is no better than the other. Neither son was a joy to his father. Both were imperfect people, but one certainly pleased his father more than the other. I personally wish Jesus had added a third son to this parable. I would have liked a son who would listen to the request, agreed to do it, and did it at once with enthusiasm. There are some important lessons for us in this story. This parable details us of two kinds of people. The one kind is those whose words are a lot better than their deeds. And the second kind is those whose deeds are a lot better than their words. So the first group is a devastating group to a congregation of believers. They say with their mouth that they believe, but their lives do not reflect it. A whole generation of young people can be turned off by our inconsistency and by our speaking piety and fidelity, but living by the world's priorities. Edwin Till Settler in Religion in Life writes, when our division was sent to do amphibious training, Late one evening, I was walking along the deck of a large armed transport, chatting with a Jewish medical officer. On his own initiative, he started to talk about religion. You know, he said, I admire the men who that book described more than any other men of whom I know. And I have tried to put into my life some of the principles he taught. But sometimes I'm puzzled. As I looked around, I find persons who can call themselves Christians, who it seems to me deny the principles this man taught. I wonder sometimes if I am not more Christian than they are, even if I am a Jew. How often are we flushed out as being this kind of fake Christians who we, when we practice stewardship, rather fail to practice it? We say that Christ is the most important thing in our lives. We say that the work of the kingdom is important. We pledge our allegiance to the Savior. But when it comes right down to it, we act out a whole different set of priorities. Everything else comes to face before we give our cash to Christ's church. Our own comforts and conveniences come way ahead of the family of God. We don't start God first. We to think of God after we have done everything else. So we just don't re, uh, ring true. The words and promises we make about our Christ and his church don't speak nearly as loud as our actions, which often say the opposite. We are indeed often like this man who says, yes, I will do it, and then he doesn't do it. At confirmation, when we promise, yes, we will be responsible for our baptism, when we are married to the altar and make those solemn vows, when we are installed as officers of the church, when we are received into the congregation of believers, when we accept responsibilities on committees, and the many other times we make promises before God and to teach others, we often like this young man who says yes but doesn't do this work. Too often in human life, enthusiasm is aroused, emotion is cheered, noble goals are glimpsed, high priorities are entertained, but no action follows. Nothing is done about it. The splendid enthusiasm are wasted. The emotions are dissipated. The soul is not capitalized on what is desired, but did not will. So perhaps the most devastating of all is the church member who says he will do something in the church and then doesn't. Every congregation is a host of these no show volunteers who drag and down the congregation's programs and the minister of Christ in the community. 
Yet, one other thing about this Christian lifestyle, not only does it present an insincere example of Christian to others, not only does it break down a congregation and its kingdom work, but it allows me self-image maker. We will know if the things we do match the things we say. Does the things we do match the things we say? We know if we are phony or sincere in the practice of the Christian faith. Are we really Christians or are we are fake Christians? Even if we keep a secret from everyone else and no one guesses, we know. We are going to think much better about ourselves and thus better people if we practice what we preach and know it. Now let's look at the other side. He says no. And then the scripture says, he repented and went. While this is far from perfect, it is much better, isn't it? It's much better because he repented and went. So this sad story is often our story. We claim to be hard-boiled, hard-headed materialists, but secretly we have our hearts tied by God and we change. We hope for more to life than this. Who among us has not been like this son who said no? But Jesus said he repented. Oh, how beautiful a father we have. We can change our minds. We can try again. We can have a change of heart and he still accept us. That is the man we are talking about. We may have said no to the appeal of, for good stewardship, for the appeal to do the committee work of the church, the appeal to pledge. We have maybe said for the appeal to tithe, to witness, to worship, and to save. How many times our answer to has been no. But our Heavenly Father allows us to remain sons and daughters and continues to love us and we can repent and do the deed. During the World War, brave people of the Danish underground had the motto, do it well and do it now. What better motto could we have as a Christian? Do it well and do it now. Christian happiness lies merely not merely in knowing what Christ would want us to do, but actually doing it. It's not just knowing what Christ wants us to do. Actually, what we do, how do we do it, is what counts. Perhaps you too ought to consider or reconsider the request of service of the Heavenly Father. Perhaps there are those no's that ought to be yeses, and you can change that. If you have turned down the invitation to sing in the choir, if you have turned down the invitation to make a stewardship pledge, to serve on a committee, to make a witness, to serve as a chairperson, to open your heart to Christ, to do the extra request of someone in the congregation, think of it now. Consider changing, repenting, making your heavenly father joyful by coming to him. The true friends of Christ are active. You are my friends if you do my commandments. That is what Christ said. Christ did not save us to sit down. As one, he said, the symbol of Christianity is not a rocking chair, but a cross. We need to be moving. Let's remember this. The real point of the parable is that neither son is anything like perfect. The real good Christian is the one whose actions and words match and ring true. William Barclay say in his commentary, on the other hand, this parable teaches us that a man can easily spoil a good thing by the way in which he does it. It's true. It's true. That we can do something very well, but ruin them in the way we do them. There are so many examples of this in the, every Christian congregation. Again, stewardship comes to mind. We can make our pledge or give our offering, but do not do it in a way that is attractive to others. We can serve on a committee or work in the church or share what we have, but do it in a begrudging way. We are always complaining. We have to be coaxed. Everyone who works with us must be careful not to hate our feelings. If someone does something you are not expecting, a lot of people have left churches because of that. 
We must be thanked over and even over again. If nobody thanks us, we leave the church again. It is easy indeed to do the right thing, but in a way that makes it un unattractive to others, especially those around us. So we learned in this parable that the Christian way is not only in performance or not in promise, but also in doing and responding in a gracious and loving and joyful manner. So Jesus summed it up all in a story recorded in Matthew 21. What do you think? <laughs> that was this question. What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, Son, go work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. And he went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I will go say, but did not. Which of the two did the will of his father? What do you think? You might be one, you might be either of the sons. So you better make a choice to say, what should I do as a Christian? When a yes becomes a no, and a no becomes a yes. This is our calling. God help us as we choose what is right, as we choose what it means to follow Christ. May the Lord bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Okay. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Lord God, who reveals us the true nature of family, we thank you for all who show us love and care, for all who bear with us when we take wrong decisions. We praise you for those who embrace us in our heart, listen to our outpourings of sorrow and regret, and do not condemn us. For all who accept us as we are, for all who make us aware of your grace, for your forgiveness and transforming power of your love, we thank you. For we acknowledge these gifts come from you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who live and reign in the perfect unit of love. Be with us, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.